Hey y'all, this is Brandon Williamson, the Director of Social Media at Young Americans for Liberty. I'm sitting down here today with Jordan from Operation Libertas. Jordan, how are you doing today? Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem, man. So, the folks at home, um, they may or may not know you. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself a little bit? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I was in the Army for nine years. I started out in the infantry and did a deployment to Iraq. And then I went Special Forces and did a deployment to Turkey and to Syria. Um, and then right around that time I was going special forces, I'd kind of gotten into libertarianism and my mind was kind of being open to some of these ideas at the same time, you know, thinking about some of those concepts while being deployed and seeing some of the things I saw on the deployment, I don't think I would have, uh, looked at those situations the same way if I hadn't have been a little red pilled. And so that made me, when I got out, want to start Operation Libertas with, you know, the goal of spreading liberty and working with any other group or organization or individuals that are like-minded uh, just to continue to push that. And obviously with my background, it seems like I, I gravitate towards or veterans gravitate towards me, but that's kind of been more of the realm and the vein that it's been working in, which I'm totally fine with because anti-war vets are some of the best people to, to talk about anti-war. So it's been fun. Yeah. Do you think uh, the, um, the veteran community in the Liberty movement, like that's how we met is through that whole thing. Um, do you think that they gravitate towards each other because of like that sense of tribe or community that you had when you were in the military, you get out and it's, I don't know about you, but like, the guys that I'm closest with in the civilian world also had served. There's a lot of shared experiences there. Um, do you think that has something to do with that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's a lot of like lingo and inside jokes that you don't really get unless you were in the military. And, and some of these even transcend generations. You know, you can talk to like a Vietnam era guy and, and you're like, oh, yeah, we were talking about stuff back then, and, you know, just the, you know, the bureaucracy of the military has not really changed that much. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can relate that just are not comparable to the civilian world. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily tribalism, just, just out of the, you know, veteran framework, because I think it's the combination of being that veteran, anti-war, libertarian, there, that's like, there's so many things that you then have in common. Um, but even the libertarian thing is probably the lowest on that top totem pole. If I'm talking to an anti-war vet that's on the left, like I probably have more in common with him than somebody on the right that like either never served or is still pro-war. Um, and so, I mean, I guess in a sense, it's kind of like tribalism in a way that's maybe like what gets your foot in the door, but then there's some other gates you have to pass, I think, to really like click with people. And this has been a pretty good, good community of the anti-war veterans, libertarians. Oh yeah, I'm a huge fan of of, uh, of the community we've got. It's it's very nice. Um, we'll come back to to uh, uh, vets with ideas in a bit here because we're going to get into the policy side of things. But um, and I've got some stories from the barracks about <laughs> terrible ideas from infantry guys, but. Uh, so um, wanted to ask real quick, uh, some of the folks at home, they might not know what Special Forces is. Could you give us a quick breakdown of that? Yeah, so uh, specifically, I mean, Special Operations Forces is kind of a broad term that covers a lot of things. Some people think of Navy SEALs and uh, Force Recon Marines and Green Berets. Well, Special Forces, Army Special Forces, is just the Green Berets. Um and a lot of people don't really know what that is, but those are the guys that went in first in Afghanistan. And they usually our job is to work with the locals and helping them, you know, overthrow their government or create an insurgency or maybe even work with the local government to repel an insurgency. But it's much more focused on working with the locals, like working with what they know works best in their country. Um, getting to know them it's a lot it's supposed to be a lot less of just kicking in doors and dropping bombs on the bad guys yeah like you guys are able to do that you're able to do the direct action the the raids kicking in doors a special reconnaissance but your real bread and butter is uh is the the training and mentoring the, the indigenous forces right well i mean at least 
theoretically that's what it's supposed to be, but after the last 20 years, the bread and butter has kind of become kicking in the doors. I had some some x-rays, which are, those are guys that come straight off the street and go right into special forces. They don't go into the regular army first. And all they knew was kicking in doors. So when we were going to Syria and it was a little bit different, it was like, for me, that it was exactly what kind of I expected Green Berets to be. But for a lot of the guys, it was like, all right, we got to switch your mindset a little because we're not going to be just kicking in doors. We got to work with the locals and put them up front and have them running the show. Nice. So, um, so you were an officer in SF. So you, uh, Hold that against me. <laughs> you, um, did that give you a, uh, kind of a peek behind the curtain of how things, uh, worked, uh, in the GWAT? Like, you know, us lower enlisted, like we didn't know Jack, like it's, this is what we're doing. That's all you're, you're getting told, like bare minimum to do what you need to do. So, did you get like more of a peek behind the curtain, uh, big picture type things? Yeah. Um, and a few, different instances um one when i was in turkey working on the border we had some of my local guys um when i say local guys i mean like local syrians that i was working with one of them was trying to broker this peace deal in this town of afrin which was kind of right in the middle of recently cleared isis territory and his idea was like we need to bring the local people back to their homes so we're not having to police them you know where they don't live somewhere else they should be able to go back home and i was like you know this is kind of an exit strategy for the u.s government and the u.s military out of syria or at least that northeastern or sorry northwestern part of syria here was an exit strategy of getting out of there well i bring that up to my commander during one of our commander update briefs and i i guess i could have been a little more tactful how I went about it, but I I said it in a group that also had some Turkish military in it. And it was just kind of brushed aside, but the Turks like lost their mind because they don't want any peace along their border. Ironically, as long as this war was going on, they were receiving all the money that the U S was putting in and all the weapons because they were funneling it to their groups and however much they might've been keeping. But Basically, we were funding their security along the southern border. So if we had, you know, done a peace deal and and made everything more like copacetic between everybody, they would have lost their funding um, because they were trying to keep the the Kurds separated. You know, if there had been a peace deal in this part of this region, it basically would have connected all of northern Syria and made it all Kurdish, which the Turks just see as their enemy. I mean, there are factions of Kurds that are terrorists, like associated with terrorist organizations. But if you're a, if you're in the Turkish military, you just view all Kurds as terrorists. So they could not have their entire border coalescing around Kurdistan. That was just one of many things that I saw. Like I got pushed back for how dare I try to, you know, try to make a peace agreement in this part of the, the country. Isn't that kind of what we should like, isn't that kind of what should be happening though? Like, shouldn't we be trying to get out of the war as soon as possible? Like, um, like why would we want to stay there? Is it just Raytheon contracts, um, medals for, uh, for generals? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously at the political level, there's some of that, like, well, we want to appease Raytheon or whoever or Raytheon's you know manipulating things but also even at at just the geopolitical level I think I think that that's kind of like somewhere in between like you've got the tactical level the guys on the ground who who think and a lot of times really are trying to just do the right thing and you got the politicians that are doing all this like evil conniving stuff to keep a war going well how do you like marry the two and in the middle there is like the operational level where you've got generals and think tanks all coming up with these solutions and geopolitical strategy and moving pieces on the chessboard. They think they're really like being sophisticated by like, well, we got to keep Russia at bay over here, but also ISIS down and Assad, but then some more support these groups. But as we've seen over the last 20 years, we always end up supporting some group that ends up biting us in the ass later on. Mm -hmm. Um, like the 1980s in, in Afghanistan or uh, 
Bush's great redirection in 05. Uh, yeah, every group that we've we've trained and equipped has at some point decided to shoot those bullets back at us. And at some point, the people in Ukraine that we're supporting will be at us if we leave or when we leave. Or even if maybe because we stayed too long, they'll use that against us. Um, so that's kind of there. You know, a lot of times people are like, well, are are leaders just evil or are they inept? And it's a little bit of both. But a lot of times they're very capable of whatever their job is, but they're trying to make this round peg fit in a square hole and they're doing mental gymnastics to make it work. I mean, it's kind of look at like Keynesian economics and how much people have to like do all you have to get this giant like master's degree level education. You've got to get this whole background and then you become, you know, the treasury secretary and you still are like, well, I just couldn't see this inflation coming when morons like me and you are like yeah we were calling this two years ago because this is common sense yeah i'm a three-time college dropout here and when we started printing trillions of dollars to send everyone stimmy checks i was like you know i'm not an expert but i'm pretty sure this is how inflation starts yeah so basically you've just got these really smart people that are looking for work and are coming up with grand geopolitical strategies to you know keep america on top and it's like I mean, even if these things work, it's like you're flirting with the margins a little bit um, while risking nuclear war or risking armed groups who are going to turn back against us and make us have continued to make us less safe um, while stripping us of a lot of our freedoms and stuff. It's just all that to do this dog and pony show of thinking I'm so smart and look at look at this one thing I did in this campaign over here. Instead of just doing the right thing, like let's end this war peacefully for everyone involved if we can, but that never crosses anyone's mind. Oh no, it's not. It's not good for uh, their corporate sponsors under um, bottom line, and it's not good for their careers. Um, so we men- you mentioned Russia a couple times here, so I want to get your input on the whole Ukraine situation. Um, we were talking last night about um, uh, what was it Fort? Was it Fort Hood where they were painting the uh, the vehicles? Um, changing them from you know desert tan to woodland green. Um, the army, you know, I wasn't in forever, but it seems like they always have a purpose to what they're doing. So, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, the 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 military is always thinking like down the road. What's our next threat? What do we need to be worried about? So, I mean, in like the most mundane sense, I could say like, all right, they're looking at China, they're looking at Russia and they're thinking maybe these are things are going, moving away from the Middle East. They've always been, they've been talking since Obama about a a pivot to Asia. And that was more like, you know, economically and diplomatically, but that also kind of goes hand in hand with militarily too. Yeah. I mean, we were, uh, there was some special operations guys, if I remember correct, that were helping out um, the the Filipino dudes um, in Manila uh, when ISIS became a thing there um, and, uh, well, and various jihadi elements. Some people don't even know like operations in the Philippines were under the initial war authorization under Bush. Like that was part of Operation Enduring Freedom was all these other little operations all over the place to help fund those guys. Um, but I mean, So going along with this, you know, painting of vehicles and why are they changing it to Woodland Green? I mean, that does fit a lot of the battlefields anywhere outside of the Middle East, but they're always looking down the road. Like when I, when I went through language training, most of us that were going to fifth group learned either Arabic and the next, that was probably like 50 to 75% of people are learning Arabic, like 20% including myself, we're learning Farsi because they're looking at Iran as a potential mm-hmm. threat. But then there was still like five to 10% of people that were still learning Russian. And it was like, what does Russia have to do with the Middle East, really? Like, when are we going to use that? And maybe parts of Afghanistan, because like maybe there's some people that might also speak that, but you need like Pashtun and some other languages before you're probably going to need Russian. And so I really just think that was, you know, they're looking down that, when they go down their list of threats, it's like, okay, we got to be able to speak in Iraq. 
And then we got to be able to speak maybe in Iran in case something happens there. And then, oh, what's the next threat? Oh, let's say Russia. So let's have some guys learn Russian so we have that capability. Um, so, there, I mean, it could be just as, as simple as that. It might not be anything more broad. But somebody brought up like, oh, yeah, well, what if, you know, civil war or something breaks out here and that might be an excuse for Russia or China to invade. And it's like, those people are not invade. First off, we can't afford to invade a country like Iraq and Afghanistan. We've gone broke doing that. So who, why do we think that China, who throughout its thousand year history has never really been an expansionary power, why do we think they would come over the Pacific to try to invade to, to what game? Um, and why, and why get involved in like the middle of some civil war that's already like, Oh, it's like, just let them shoot each other or something. And then maybe we'll come in and clean up after and I mean, logistically, it's not a good idea to invade America. There's 300 and I think it's 60 million guns in civilian hands here dispersed uh, among like 184 million gun owners. Like, uh, I think it was uh, Admiral uh, Hirohito during World War II said that if the Japanese invaded America, there'd be a rifle behind every blade of grass. That hasn't changed. We've just gotten more guns. Like yeah. now, instead of a rifle behind every blade, it's three rifles behind every blade. Yeah. So would, I don't think that anyone's going to invade us. And whether it's all the veterans that have come back that are very well trained, or you know the rednecks and hillbillies and mountain people that are probably even better trained when it comes to shooting guns, uh, it's not going to be pretty. Except for maybe in like maybe in some cities or something, but. Cities are also pose their own challenges. I mean, it's just it, we could get rid of our military and really not have to worry about being invaded. I think we can handle it ourselves pretty well. I mean, the best thing yeah. we could do is just carpet bomb America. Yeah, and I mean that would come with its own set of blowback, uh, international pressure, and all that mm-hmm. against them. But I, I do think we're kind of in a, a great situation just because of our culture that we are very, very safe from any foreign threat deciding to come here in any mass. Like you might have one or two, you know, like you might have a Fort Hood guy, but that's an isolated incident. It's not a, an invasion. It is one dude deciding to act for an ideology that he supports. And, you know, it, it's wrong to kill people for, you know, that reason, but you know, it's, it's not a, an existential threat, like a, a nation state invading a nation state. Yeah. So, um, what I want to ask you, what do you think the, um, the Biden administration is going to do next with Russia? Like they've been kind of just screwing up constantly. Um, thankfully Biden hasn't had any more gaffes, uh, in the last couple months, uh, that's pushed us closer to war. But, you know, he did say that to the 82nd, when he was talking to them, that when you guys get into Russia, you're going to see X, Y, and Z, uh, which implied that there's an invasion um, coming at some point, you know, he's teased regime change and then the, the uh, White House press has had to backpedal that. Um, what do you think he's going to do? Do you think those were, um, were him uh, showing his hand a little bit, just kind of showing the, um, the playbook or was it just Biden being Biden's blowing hot air? I mean, I think in one sense, the the only restraint on the U S military and the U S government with, as it pertains to certain countries is whether or not they have nuclear weapons. It seems to be, they're trying to see how far they can push nuclear armed countries without creating a nuclear war, which is, you know, a really terrible approach because if you go too far and find out too late, what are you going to do about it? But I mean, I only think, I think that's, Part of it, the other I think is it's just, I think the American empire is a wounded tiger. A a wounded tiger is very dangerous because it's hurt and it's scared and it's lashing out a tiny, like a squirrel runs by and it's going to lash out at it because it thinks it's a threat because the tiger's used to being big and mean. But when that, the tiger is going to die. But in the process, it could do a lot of damage as it goes down. And really, I think that's what it is. I mean, I don't think Russia or China or anybody takes anything Biden says seriously. I don't. I think everybody knows that he's not really in control. Um, I think most people, even when they voted for him, was like, uh, you know, he's 
he's not that great, but he's not Trump. And also there's going to be people around him like running the show, which is kind of, I think most people understand that is kind of how it works. You can't have one man running an entire country without, you know, a staff and support. But it's also very telling that people aren't really voting for this person. So is it really like, how dem- democratic is this? You're voting for who that person's going to like put around him. Yeah. And, you know, like we have our current national debt is what, like uh, 30 trillion, something like that. Like yeah. military operations are expensive. Like could, I don't think we could even afford to go to war with Russia without bankrupting the country and collapsing our economy. And then that would bring on a whole host of other issues. Like, I mean, you know, I think we're already on the precipice of a recession and with the economic policies of the, uh, the current administration, I think they're really putting us in jeopardy of pushing that recession into a depression. So uh, what do you think the calculus going on in DC is right now for, for these policies and, and this um, kind of saber rattling this, you know, pushing Russia as far as we can before something pops off. I think it's all talk to make people think that whether it's other nations or our own citizenry, think that America is still strong, but it's all just talk. I mean, you ask if we can afford to, if we could afford to invade Russia. I don't think we can afford to, I think if we ended all of our military engagements, we still couldn't afford what we're currently doing. I mean, like you said, we're $30 trillion in debt, so we can't afford what we're currently doing. And with the way inflation's going right now, I mean, they're they're just now admitting that the numbers are a little higher. You know, it came out Friday, I forget what the number was, but that it was higher than anticipated. And it's like, yeah, we all know it's way higher than that. I I think we're close to having printed 50% of all U.S. dollars within the last two years. 60%. Oh, yeah, cool. it's at sixty percent. Um, cool. we printed sixty percent of all U.S. currency and and circulation from so twenty twenty to now. If you're an Austrian or understand Austrian economics, you understand that inflation then is somewhere between fifty and sixty percent just in the last two years, mm-hmm. as, as in the increase of the money supply. So you're telling me that price inflation is twelve percent or something like? Yeah. No, even if it was, well, it's about to shoot up a lot higher because. We know there's twice as much dollars in circulation. And now, granted, that's globally, too. That's not all like here in the U.S., but it's also a global economy where everybody's going to rise and fall with each other. Um, yeah, and what was the CPI? It was, uh, was it 12% that they, they came out with? I forget where I heard it. I heard it on a podcast earlier today, and I don't know if they were necessarily quoting the CPI or not, but I, I believe that's what they were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, because I've I remember seeing it. I don't I just don't remember the exact number they put out, but like gas is up at least forty four percent. Like I'm at the point I drive a, a diesel truck. Like it is it's a nice truck, it gets good gas mileage. Like I get about twenty five miles a gallon. But like when it's time for me to fill up, like I I don't look at at diesel when I'm driving around at the price of it just because of how high it is. Like it is ridiculously high, so I don't even worry about it until I absolutely cannot delay anymore. I think that they're okay, fudging so the numbers. There. But the price of fuel does not have any effect on the CPI because they've taken oh. that out of the basket of goods. I did not know they've that. Taken housing out of the basket of goods. Back in, I forget when this took place, but they took steak out and put in ground beef because they said, "Well, the consumer is now eating ground beef." Well, they're eating ground beef because the price of steak is too high. So they keep taking these things out of the basket of good that makes up the CPI, and that's so why it's only. 12 percent and it's like they're just playing with the numbers exactly if you (laughs) you you can make numbers say whatever you want you keep taking out all the things that are inflating um see i had a i had an inclination that they were uh they were fudging the numbers but i didn't know that they'd actually taken gas out so i I appreciate you teaching me that and that's not even new like they've been doing that so i mean i remember thinking in like the early 2000s they used to talk about like three percent increase in the gdp is like a strong economy and i'm like Looking back, I'm like, that wasn't keeping up with inflation. If you actually look at all the numbers, like everyone knows what the housing market was doing before 08. And like that, that's inflation. Like that is, or that is price inflation, 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's just like a lot of this is just 
our problem used to be educating people on this because you have to give them a little bit of Austrian economics to have them understand these things. But now people can just see it plain as day. They're like, there's no way. Like you just, you didn't even know about the CPI and the bas- how they manipulate those numbers, but you knew it wasn't right because you can look at how much gas has gone up. People yep. can look and, at how much housing costs. And groceries and everything. Like I remember about um, before November, back um you know, 2021, I was going, I was shopping for two people. I was engaged at the time and, um, that didn't quite work out, but I'd go shopping and for two people for two weeks worth of food, I'd spend 150, maybe $200. Now, just for me, I'm having to go spend two fifty three hundred dollars because of how much the cost of everything has gone up. Like it's, it's incredible. Like I think we're going to have to get back to the, uh, the depression era cooking at some point if this keeps going. Well, and people, um, I don't ever watch the news, but I happened to pass by a TV that had CNN on it. And I just saw the caption and it said um, something about like the, a recession is likely to happen soon. Mm-hmm. And I've heard in some other places that that's kind of what the corporate press is, is talking about. Like, oh, recession is coming soon. And I'm like, looking around, and I'm we're, like, here. we're already in a recession. Like, I don't care if, again, if you go by the book, I think by the book, a recession is two quarters in a row of like the stock market having dropped below it's whatever previous part, like basically it going down and in, in within two quarters. Well, I mean, it's going up because even stocks prices are inflated when you print a bunch of money and give it to companies that then buy their own stock and their price goes up. That's just inflation too. Just like a, you're talking about at the store with groceries, the value of that stock is not actually increased. Did they get any more assets to, did Boeing double how many planes they exist that exist now, or do they just have more dollars to now prop their stock up? Um, so this talk of like, whether we're in, like, I'm, I'm more concerned, like, are we heading towards a depression, possibly another great depression? Um, and I know that seems kind of like black pilled and that's um, not, not really. really. I mean, if you look at the situations that surrounded the great depression, what's uh, surrounding us, um, you know, the, the increase in, in money supply that happened after the federal reserve started printing money. And, you know, um, they also, there was a relaxing of, uh, of lending practices, all sorts of things. Um, uh, lowering of interest rates by the fed, which, you know, they did in 20, uh, what was it? 2020 that they dropped interest rates to a historic low because people weren't buying houses. Um, I think all of like, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like we're kind of mirroring some of those uh, those situations that led to the Great Depression. Yeah, and I'm uh, 100% convinced they're going to try to do price controls. Um, I just saw something on online where somebody was complaining about the Republicans having blocked this. Um, yep, the gas price bill. control bill. Yeah, and I was like, yep. I have no idea what this bill is. I have no idea what the verbiage says, but I guarantee it was basically price controls. It was. It was 100%. Yeah, and that's the worst thing you could do. That is exactly what FDR tried to do, and that's why the Great Depression lasted for as long as it did because you can't keep prices at a certain level and then expect companies to just magically develop, you know, produce whatever it's oil or food or whatever at these prices. Like, it's just you can't do that. Meanwhile, under FDR, they were, like, literally throwing food away so that they could keep the prices where they needed to be. It was just, it's, it is just a complete disaster. The only way you can get into a depression is by having the government control it. Um, and that's just something that we have got to message better to people. And I think most people are just kind of getting it. They already see how bad it is. You know, they may not be like Austrians and they may not totally be hip to like what's really going on behind the scenes, but they can just, it's so blatant right now. I think that, is our opportunity to, you know, educate people on like, like, this is what's going on. You just have to package it in a way that is palpable for people. And you, know, you talked about, uh, for a second there, um, the, um, uh, the, what FDR did with the farmers where, you know, they were paying them to, or they were buying, um, food from the farmers, uh, and then disposing of it to try to, you know, artificially control the, the price of food that still goes on today. Like we still have, um, uh, farm subsidies for, for things like corn. I was talking to, so I grew up in a, uh, small town down Southeast Alabama and North Florida, just kind of bounce around that area. But, um, 
like my friends back home, you know, it's an agricultural community and a lot of the farmers get subsidies for various things. And, you know, they're my buddies, when we were talking, they're talking about how hard it is on the farmer right now. Farmers aren't making any money. And I was like, yeah, well, you got to think the farmers are going for these crops that the government's subsidizing. They're getting paid a lower rate for them. If they would take and step away from that, if we would do away with these subsidies, then the farmers would have to pick whatever crop is most likely to give them a profit. Like the whole issue like this, is just, you know, it's a microsm, but you know, that one issue government control of that is hurting that segment of the population. And it's not limited to just them. It is across the board. I'm just using that as an example to like illustrate that point though. You know? Yeah. I think, um, a lot of times, and I'm not trying to say that like farmers are, are receiving handouts, but a lot of times people look at handouts and they think of people on welfare. And most people understand like that just keeps them down. Well, it is mm-hmm. kind of the same with farmers. Uh, it's also even the same with corporate bailouts. Like it is kind of out in East Tennessee. Like I know a lot of older guys that are, are retired and they're very conservative, very like Republican, and but they will back a, a, a bailout in a second because they're retired and they're looking at their stock portfolios plummeting. And it's like, man, you you will turn into a communist the second it, it would benefit you, even if it's at the detriment of your kids and your grandkids. But all these are, are also handouts that are really keeping you down because it is creating this system that you do disagree with but you're willing to sacrifice your principles to have your portfolio go up. Where if, like you said with the farmers, if they would just do what was right, if, if these guys with their portfolios would just acknowledge that maybe a lot of the things that they're invested in are not actually producing very much, it's mostly just inflated stock prices, and they would kind of pull back out of that system, and whether it's in, invest in Bitcoin or maybe more gold or just better stocks that actually were producing, but they're leaving that in the hands of some financial advisor who, again, has kind of like we were talking about with these generals and these strategists that they have studied all this stuff to learn how to gain the system really, but it's all just kind of funny money. It's all just this Ponzi scheme at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And like, you remember, uh, you remember 2020 when they were talking about the, uh, the airlines are too big to fail because we had never heard that line before, you know, um, during the depression, there was a lot of, of businesses that shouldn't have existed. They had very poor business practices, were wasteful with money, um, and other resources in general. And it was, it's kind of the same thing with the airlines. They're not doing things in the most efficient way because they know that the, the federal government's going to back them up. If I think if we want to grow as a country, like economically and all that, we need to trim the fat. You know, there. If your business is inefficient, that is a you problem. The taxpayers should not be bailing you out. You should be figuring out how to to streamline operations and make things more efficient. And so, when I said earlier that I think a great, you know, another great depression is coming, and I was. I, quickly said I don't want that to sound like a black pill like I'm very white pilled about that scenario because I think we have just reached a point and 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 the Fed has been capable of kicking this can down the road so maybe I'll leave the door open that maybe they can do it again but I'm pretty white pilled in the fact that I think other countries are bailing on the dollar when they printed all this money since 2020 it wasn't other countries buying treasure U.S. treasury bonds to back up that debt, it was the Fed buying its own. That's like Mm -hmm. taking a credit card out to pay off another credit card. You haven't done anything. You just, all right, I got another month until I have to pay off this credit card now. Um, And so I don't think that they're going to be able to just print their way out of it. Or if they do, it's just going to rapidly increase how quickly everything falls. But I do think that there's things like Bitcoin that people can fall back on that can actually hold their value and the the, tr- the fat will be trimmed very quickly because there won't be anything, I think, I believe that the government can do to try to prop it up. I think even if they put in price controls, it's all of it's going to be too late. Um, I mean, they do still have the barrel of a gun to try to force some of these things. But I think there's enough of the population that's just sick of it. And they're not going to – there's half the population that 
you know, probably will take up arms and be like, no, you've had two, you've had two years of like locking us down and telling us to put things in our body. And now you're trying to control the economy when we know you've already screwed it up. And I think there's enough of the other half of the country that at least tacitly understands like, this is not right. At least half of that other half of, of the left is like, no, nah, this isn't right. Like we've got to go down another route. Cause honestly, most of your just blue pill democratic liberals think that they don't want socialism. They just don't understand that's what we currently already have. Like they're not ready to go to the Bernie Sanders level. That's more of like the younger generation on the left that kind of gets ramped up for that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm very optimistic about it, but that doesn't mean that there won't be pain in, you know, over the course of a year or two. But if, if we can just get the government to just back off, it'll rebound very quickly because we'll get rid of all that fat. We'll have nothing but just smooth working companies. And I'm sure jobs would flood back here. Um, So, I mean, I'm very optimistic about the future, but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be some pain that we have to go through. Yeah. And, you know, um, I remember, I think it was in the fed, um, Ron Paul, he talked about, you know, when the fed does these types of things where they kick the can down the road, like, yeah, they temporarily avoid the issue. All they're really doing in the end is eventually the issue is going to come up and it's just going to be worse the longer we put it off. And like, you know, with whole, the whole depression thing, like depression sucks, you know, like people lose their jobs, people go hungry. It's it's not great. But at the same time, <clears throat> like everyone wants to point towards um, towards the, the post-World War II era as our strongest economic time, right? Like how many times have you heard that? Like a yeah. million times. Well, you know, the Great Depression officially ended in 1943. And in the post-war period, we saw that what everyone points to as the strongest economy. And I think a big part of that is because the economy had had killed off the, the fat, like companies that were inefficient and bad practices in the marketplace had died because you know, we just had a depression. There wasn't enough money going around to, to support them. And I think long term, uh, if we do have another depression, it could very well be a another boom uh, for us. Like it, it's going to suck when it's happening, but long term, I think it might be actually a good thing because the market's correcting itself; it's getting back to where it needs to be. Yeah, and I think you know the Great Depression happened shortly after the Fed was created, so they were trying to figure out, okay, we just created this monster. How do we manage it? And for a hundred years, they learned how to manage it but that didn't mean that the monster wasn't still there. They just kept inflating the bubble, popping it, inflating the next one, popping, inflating the next one. And I just think that this one is just too big to overcome. Um, Mm -hmm. Once I saw that other countries were not buying up U S treasury bonds and that they were, they were investing more in gold and getting gold in their central banks. I was like, yeah, at the end of the day, countries know where the money actually lies. They were willing to use this U S government fiat for a while while it benefited everybody, but it was a Ponzi scheme at the end. Oh yeah. Don't be so, like holding the bag. <laughs> if you right now could change one of our economic policies, uh, what would you do? What would, what would be your one choice if you could change one, one policy? I mean, I don't know if this is just a policy is more of an agency, but I would just get rid of the federal reserve. Um, I mean that, but that's, I think maybe bigger than your question. No, that, that works for it. (laughs) (laughs) Thinking smaller scale on things that would need to be done is like, we've just got to get, it's not even that we have to do anything. We have to stop doing things. We could just get the government to be like, look, you've screwed this up. You don't know what you're doing. Just back off. Like, I mean, if we did just maybe end the Fed, like it might be more painful quicker. Again, I think we'd get over it quicker, but it could be more painful. There might be some ways to like, let's roll this thing back. I don't know. As I say that out loud, I'm like, no, I think the second you roll it back, it's going to collapse. And that's why I think they have to keep some of these things going. I don't know if there is even one policy that they could roll back economically that wouldn't just bring the house of cards tumbling down. I think it's that unstable that just any one one change for the better is going to... Look at them talking. Just, I don't even think... I think they were maybe going to release the news today if they were going to do it, but just the mere idea of them raising 
the Fed rate another 75 basis points yep. sent everything tumbling down again. And it's like, that doesn't, I mean, after we raise it a half a point, it like crashed the economy. I mean, this is just, and that is, that is back in the seventies when we were trying to get inflation under control, they raised the interest rate to 20% and it, it hurt and it fixed the inflation temporarily, but there's no way they could raise it. To, I mean, look at what they're talking about with three quarters of a point and there's no way they can, even if they could get it to 20, that's, I don't think that's good enough to stop this as we just talked about 50 to 60% of the dollars in circulation created in the last two years. Like, you're, I think it's just beyond, I, I don't know, maybe the best policy is just, hey, continue what you're doing. You're doing a great job at ending this yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or, I mean, it's get, at some point it's going to get so bad, we're going to have to just r- scrap the system and start from scratch. And now we're going to have to have a major change and just, um, just to uh, put it out there for everyone at home, I am. Um, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate on some of these questions. I'm. <laughs> I understand this stuff. I'm just trying to get him to give us answers. Um, so, uh, Wanda, to, to circle back to something you said earlier, you said um, when you were in, you started to go down the libertarian road. Um, was there like one big thing that that really sparked it for you and like really? brought to your mind like i don't know how um like how it was in your head like i remember like my libertarian journey has been long like um you know i read uh it started with reading the communist manifesto and i was like oh my god this is horrible so then i um i read another uh political manuscript because i was interested in history and all that and it was from world war ii and i was like well this was one half of the war in world war ii let's read the other half so i read a a book from a, some, some guy with a really small mustache. And I was like, wow, this dude's insane. And I was like, okay, so like, let's read more modern stuff and started reading, you know, <clears throat> didn't really much get into Keynesianism because it just didn't make sense to me that you could break a window and somehow that's going to generate money. It just never really clicked with me. But I remember I read, uh, and the fed and some other stuff from, uh, Ron Paul and Cato and reason and all them back in the day. And that's how I started on it. And I kind of just like, I was kind of like one of those milk toast Republicans for a long time, you know, like not quite libertarian, but definitely not like establishment neocon, you know, somewhere in, in the middle. And then when I was in, I saw just like ridiculous amounts of waste. Like I remember, um, I remember we, one of the last days, uh, from one of the last, uh, field rotations I was on before I went over to Horsehead and started, uh, riding horses, I saw the cooks just like had to go over to help them with something and I just saw them throwing like cases and cases and cases of food and steaks away. Like it was just ridiculous. I'm like, I said to one of them, I was like, why are you guys doing that? And they're like, oh, it's the end of rotation. We have to throw it out. And I was like, why? Just give it to the dudes in the barracks and we'll have a cookout. Like we have grills. Like, you know, the defect sucks. You guys suck at your job. So just let us do it. <laughs> and it's like, I started thinking on it and reading some stuff. And I found out that that was yeah, on a small scale, how government entities get their budgets next year is they have to use up the entirety of their budget this year. And so that contributes towards that. So was there any one specific thing that really just kind of hit the spark with you? Um, I mean, you know, there was, there was this, you know, journey of, you know, I think even back in college, I thought that I was libertarian. And then I think I mentioned that to one of my dad's buddies and he was like oh you're not a libertarian you're not a weirdo and i was like oh they're weirdos and uh turns out confirm i am one (laughs) wrong to judge them for being weirdos and think that was a bad thing um and really it was like the the hillary trump campaigns that i was like there's no way i'm voting for either of these um so that's what kind of started me down that road like oh there was a libertarian option um and so it's kind of funny that I hear all the time, like Gary Johnson didn't convince anybody. I'm like, well, no, he didn't. But like, because he was there as a third option, it made me kind of look into this a little more. Um, but I mean, the, the biggest thing for me that was like, I'm like, I'm anti-war and these libertarians have opened up my mind and I have now like verified what they're saying is true was, um, when I was in, in Syria and 
you know, we had, we'd get intel and we'd, we'd drop bombs on targets and stuff. And, you know, I've been doing this for a while. And then in this one instance, the, we saw on the, on the feed, um, so we were watching the camera, you know, from like the predator drone or whatever it was. Um, we see the bomb come through the roof of the house, but it doesn't explode. It's a dud. And, and about 20 seconds later, like 15 women and children come running out of the building. And it's like, before every strike, we have to confirm that there's no women and children. Well, that just means like, there's nobody outside playing, you know, that clearly is a, a woman or a child. Um, they have to be like a military aged male, which is also ridiculous because you could be targeting one person and well, there's 20 military aged males around. I guess they're all bad, guilty by association. Um, yeah, like, oh, sorry, we blew up your Boy Scout troop. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it just made me realize, well, how many other strikes have we done where, you know, most of the time it's the middle of the night. Of course, everyone's like inside sleeping. Of course, we can't see through those buildings to know there's women and children there. We just kind of got lucky that we didn't kill them, but I'm sure there were other, I mean, there's no way for me to know every other building we ever bombed could have had women and children in it. There's no way to know. So I know some of them at least did. Um, and that was just, even though we were following everything by the, the letter of the military law and, you know, the laws of war and everything, you know, technically we were okay, but I was like, well, what, the, what does technically mean when we are killing innocent people? And this is also making our strategy here worse. We're pissing off more people and this is just going to ferment more hate and anger. So all the things that I had, you know, I wasn't part of that Ron Paul revolution and I didn't see like the Giuliani moment and all that, but I'd heard about it afterwards and people talking about how, you know, blowback and we're just pissing people off and it was like, well, here's why. And that was kind of the nail in the coffin of like, yeah, this, i I'm got to get out and I can't be a part of this anymore. And I've got to do whatever I can while I'm still here to like cut back on whatever I could. Um, and, and not much I could have done at the time. So actually a lot of what I've done since getting out is kind of my, me repenting for, sins from my previous life speaking of so, which go to operation dot operation libertas dot com forward slash shop you can buy scott horton's book enough already for twelve dollars which will pay for me to give out a free book and that's just something else i'm doing to try to um, i don't keep any of the money it's just it all goes to sending out sending out your book whatever you order and sending out a free book to somebody and I 100% recommend everyone read that book. It is incredible. Um, <clears throat> Scott Horton is a great dude. Um, me and him have spent many, many hours uh, at various events talking about foreign policy. He is very sharp. You will not be disappointed with that book. It is an incredible piece of literature. Yeah, it's. I mean, I mean, it's just jam packed of information. So. I wanted to ask you a question. So, like with that, uh, the strike that you were talking about, how did um how did the intel uh, not reflect that there were women and children on target? Like, um, was it just signals intel just pinged a cell phone and like, up oh, the dude's there, we blow him up. Uh, no human intel or no confirmation of any sort. So the rules of engagement were we had to have two independent sources of intel to execute a strike. Um, the most common Thing we would get would be a sig signal intel of somebody's cell phone that was basically on a watch list. So your cell phone number pinged off of the off of you know equipment that we were using, and we can geolocate that you're within 50 meters of this area. Well, then we had this basically think of Google Maps, and all over it are these little dots of intel of anything that's ever happened in the last 10 years within this part of Syria. Um, over that amount of time, you're just dropping pins on intel. Eventually, you could pretty much cover the entire map, every single building of some piece of intel, because um, nobody's confirming that this intel is even like accurate or anything. It's just, you know, something happened there that somebody reported. Now it counts as intel. So... You know, it was very easy. As long as you had the cell phone signal pinging, 
it was very easy to get the second piece of intel to confirm a strike. Um, you didn't have anybody on the ground like peeking their head through a window to be like, "Yeah, just just one terrorist in this building." You you have no idea who's in there. So unless there were women and children outside of the building, uh, there was no way, no way. Yeah. Hey, that to me that seems very negligent on the part of the military, especially with the the insistence by um you know by the military at various points that were there for counterinsurgency purposes like if you're doing counterinsurgency you probably want to avoid civilian casualties so you're not pissing off the population and having them join the insurgency seems like a losing strategy to me yeah i think it was mccrystal that talked about insurgency math and mm -hmm. you know everyone wanted to say well we've killed 10,000 terrorists this year and it's like yeah Everyone you kill, you also, whether he was even guilty or not, you've killed him. You've probably had some collateral damage of killing his son or his brother. And those people have sons and brothers and wives and sisters and cousins and all these other people that are really pissed that the, that the military, that the U.S. government uh, just committed this act against their loved one. Whether they were guilty or not, and they may not have known whether they were a terrorist or up to anything good and... I have a strong suspicion that most likely they really weren't. Um, it's anything that you and I would do if, if one of our loved ones was mm -hmm. killed by, you know, whether it was, especially an invading nation. Yeah. Like, I mean, um, you do? Do, you ever, do you ever see the, uh, the Ron Paul ad? Uh, I think it was for 2012 um, Chinese troops in Texas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like that is a great example of this. Like, if the Chinese set up a base right now in Texas and started running counterinsurgency missions all over the place because, you know, the Texans aren't very happy that the Chinese are there, eventually they're going to kill civilians. When they kill civilians, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when your mom or your dad gets killed in a strike, even though they weren't doing anything, or even if they were doing anything, like they're still your family. Like, yeah, you know, there was a, a book by David Kilcullen, who's, I don't know if he's necessarily a neocon, but he's definitely, his books are used for that. But this was a pretty good one. It was called Accidental Guerrilla. And it was basically talking about how people in Afghanistan, like, it was, the, you know, their dad or their granddad had fought against the Russians and, like, at the same foxhole or the same fighting position where they had set up ambushes against the Russians. And their granddad's granddad had fought the Brits. So like that was your, that was what you did when there was an invading army and you you picked up a gun and you fought back. Like that mm -hmm. was, has been part of their tradition. It wasn't that they even knew what America was or who these, that these people were even from America. Um, it was just, these are foreigners who are trying to kill us. I'm not going to sit yep. back and take it. Um, and that was, I, I read that while I, you know, long before I started reading into any of this libertarianism stuff. And I was just, just from my, like, I'm in the military trying to do the right thing and, and think about perspectives from, you know, even the enemy. It was like, yeah, of course these people are fighting us. Like, why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's the natural thing to do. Like, I mean, you know, if you think of the country, like, if you think of it as like, this is that people's home, right? Like, if someone kicks in your door right now, what are you doing? Are you just going to, oh, okay, how you doing, buddy? Like, no, you're going to pick up a gun and you're going to force them out. Yeah. It is the natural human response. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I don't like my government, but if another government comes in and tries to install somebody, like, I'm, I'm more willing to defend my old government that I didn't like to stop them from imposing some new form of foreign occupation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I honestly like, I completely understand why the Afghans fought us, and you know, I think that um, you That's know, like a good track record of doing it. So why wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, like the only army in history that successfully conquered to any extent the Afghans was the Mongols, and the only reason they did it was because they rolled into the country and were like, "Hey guys, pay us taxes and we'll leave." And the Afghans were just like, "Fine, get out." <laughs> like. That was it. Everyone else who's tried it has died. They call it the graveyard of empires for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, man. So I will, 
I mean, this isn't related to what we were just talking about, but just something in general, strategy-wise, that I think um, libertarians should be kind of pushing with any of their maybe conservative friends. Um, there is a schism right now in the Republican Party. Um, I think there's one in the Democratic Party, too, but let, for now, let's focus on the, Demo on the Republicans. There's a lot of people, whether they're MAGA or not, that just don't like what they consider the rhinos, you know, Republican mm -hmm. in name only. And they're, there's a lot of primaries going on where they're trying to, you know, get their non-rhino person in. And sometimes that's working, sometimes that's not. So how do you, how do they convince um, the Republican Party to steer away from the establishment rhinos and get what they want. Well, I would tell, I've been telling my buddies, you know, the few that I have that are more MAGA or Republican conservative types, and even my bourbon night of, of you know, older retired guys, I've been telling them like, look, the, the Libertarian Party has now gone through a change with the, you know, the Reno reset and their messaging is more on point. So if they start seeing what they're talking about, they might be like, oh, you are onto something there. I'm telling them to temporarily vote for whoever you're going to vote for. I don't, you know, a lot of them are worried about not voting for a Republican and a Democrat winning. Vote for whoever you want to vote for. I'll tell them. But switch your your party affiliation, or, or if you don't have one, join the Libertarian Party. Show the Republicans that you are hemorrhaging people because you are not listening to what they want. And join the Libertarian Party. Now, the other thing that'll do is it'll make the Libertarian Party look like it's growing. Whether we get candidates that are voted for or not, it'll be more of a threat to the establishment. And it puts pressure on the Republican Party to try to reform some of their more establishment ways, even though they may not be things we agree with. Out of the group of people that are going to come over to Libertarianism and then start you know, receiving emails because of it, or maybe follow it or learn about it a little more, there's going to be a segment, and I think probably a larger segment than most people would think, that will see this as, oh, these guys are on to something. They're 90% of what they're talking about agrees with what I want. And so I think we can start stealing some people from that way, or if nothing else, at least help turn the Republican Party into being less establishment. I mean, I'm not pro MAGA, but that's better than the establishment rhinos. And that's just something that I would, if, if people have friends and relatives that are kind of in that vein, like tell them still vote for your MAGA guy. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but show them, show the Republican party what's going on and scare the, scare the crap out of them because they will get scared if they start seeing their numbers dropping and people joining another party. That's no, the only well, thing that'll change their mind. Politicians, the only thing they understand is political pain. If their their reelection uh, prospects aren't at jeopardy, they're not going to listen to you. Access politics doesn't exist or doesn't work. Uh, the only way to make change is to make politicians feel pain. And I'm glad you brought up the the rhinos because that reminded me what I was going to ask you before. <laughs> so, um, so you know, the House has gone ahead and they've passed uh, um, a package of anti second amendment legislation and the Senate has announced that, you know, they have a, a framework for a legislation that has enough votes to pass. Um, you know, 10 GOP senators have signed on to, uh, to back it. So what do you think, um, <clears throat> is going to happen with that? Like assuming it passes, how do you think that's going to play out? Do you think it's going to be like uh, nullification from the States? Do you think it'll be, um, some form of balkanization. Um, what do you think? I mean, I think it's probably going to be a little bit of nullification. I don't know if it's like straight up like civil war or anything. I just think it's like people are so kind of done with the system in general, really from both sides. I mean, there's, there's Democrats who are, are sick of, you know, the constitution because it's getting way in the way of how fast they want to progress things. Um, and then, I mean, you still have your Republicans that are kind of 
holding on to the constitution as the thing that's like gonna save them or protect them but it's what has it done to limit the size of government um and i mean if if they wanted that they should go back to the articles of confederation the whole reason that they basically the articles of confederation were limiting the size of government it was working so they had to get rid of that because you know the big businesses the big interests and the people that did want big government needed something that worked a little better that was allowing to expand the size of government so people need to kind of get off their their high horse of the constitution being the thing that will save them but there are things culturally like you know like the declaration of independence and things that were said in that and then the bill of rights i do think those concepts within our culture are things we do and should hold on to um i mean freedom of speech freedom of religion the right to bear arms the to be free of uh search and seizure without a warrant i mean there are things that like that is those are things we learn kind of like um like during the enlightenment that these are not things that like government government will always abuse it we need to be we need to protect against these things. Um, those those are all things that are kind of part of our, our culture that you know i think whether it's state or regions are pulling away and going into their I feel like we should still be, why wouldn't we continue to be this big economy and let goods and services travel, but as far as like local laws or whatever, just have it be what the local people want. I mean, we've had a, Dave Smith's put this pretty well, like we've had this white hot culture war about abortion and one side sees it as murder and the other side sees it as invading a woman's bodily autonomy. I don't agree with people's bodily autonomy being messed with and I don't agree with murder either. So how do you reconcile those two differences? Well, the best thing would be just to break that down to the individual level, but the next best thing is to at least let states decide. Uh, and there's, there's just so many people that, there's going to be people in California that don't like that because they're like, well, people in Alabama should be, getting, should be able to get abortions. And it's like, well, you're in California and you still can. And the people, a lot of the people in Alabama don't like it. So, I mean, I, I thought you were for democracy. And it's kind of the same thing with the guns, too. I mean, now they are spinning this narrative into, like, anybody that supports gun laws wants kids dead. Like, that, they are evil people that want kids to die in school. And it's like, that's, that's not even a, a faith-based argument right there. You're just, you're not arguing in good faith. Um but if that's really what you believe, and then the other side believes, like, no, if I give up my guns, then the government is going to force inject me with whatever they say that I need to have for whatever virus is going around this year. Um, and you, those are just irreconcilable. So I don't know if it's a uh, big, like, civil war breakdown, but it's definitely got to be, I'm sure it's going to be pushed more toward balkanization and, and secession. Or at the very least, nullification. Um, and I think people are going to have to kind of get in with their local sheriffs too and have these conversations and see where their head's at on it, which direction they're going to go. Mm-hmm. I definitely think, I personally think that nullification for this type of situation is what's going to happen, similar to what we saw with marijuana in a whole bunch of states. And um, I think that that's, I agree with you. Like, I think that, you know, as small of a group as we can, uh, they should be dictating how they run their lives, you know. Like, realistically, the government's never going to let an individual decide what's okay for him. They're always going to have some regulation. So I am completely in favor of bringing it down to the <clears throat> to the state level and, you know, <clears throat> letting it ref- reflect the culture and the, the views of that demographic, the people that live in that specific state. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's almost no way around it. That's where people are just getting just more hateful and hateful of the other side and it's like it's it's like if you just take a step back and just actually like talk to these people and not actually believe what the corporate press is telling you you would not be this adamantly hateful of another group um and it's amazing that like the corporate press wants to get rid of hate speech and they're the biggest purveyor of it maybe second to the government 
I completely agree, man. So, <clears throat> well, I know you got things to do. So that was going to be our last question. I think we said, um, all right, man. Well, I appreciate having you on today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate it. Thank you.